I think the incentives turned because a you had to these television networks they have to get companies that will advertise right um and and so if they're speaking out against some of these powerful monopolies that are rising whether they're phar pharmaceutical companies or 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 other um companies that have have gained power in our current system then they might not get them as as advertisers and then when it came to the politicians all of a sudden it was about access you know being able to sell the idea of that exclusive interview with the mayor or the governor or whoever it might be so they're they're they were hungry for access as opposed to you know i always saw journalism as that fourth branch of government you're supposed to hold them accountable um and and make sure that corruption is not happening around you and you're supposed to stand as that that neutral voice for the public and uh, and I saw less and less of that. It was more about gaining access to the political voices or to the to the big company voices. Um, and so that starts to cross over into PR, you know, no longer journalism, which is one of the reasons I think I focus so much on investigative, because, you know, I think you're doing a good job as a journalist if the people at City Hall are kind of worried when you're coming around or calling, you know, they're, they're a little bit nervous. <laughs> Have you ever felt like the only Bitcoin enthusiast in your area? I certainly did. It is literally why I started the podcast was just to meet other Bitcoiners. As it turns out, there was an easier way. I could have simply joined Orange Pill app. Orange Pill app is the ultimate social layer in Bitcoin. It was built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. It is where you will find other Bitcoiners in your local area. It is where you will find events in your local area and where you can also connect with merchants who take Bitcoin. So please hop on a board, use the affiliate link below, and I'll look forward to seeing you there. Incredibly happy to have with me here today, Natalie Brunel, who many of us already know is the host of Coin Stories and Bitcoin Educator. Welcome to Bitcoin People, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to chatting with you. It's gorgeous to have you here. You've told your story many times. You're a well-known face in the community via mainstream media, as well as via your own show. Uh, I would love to, for those people who don't know very much about you, get a bit of a sense of what, what always strikes me about your story is how the values of your childhood and then your chosen career and the skill set you got from the chosen career, so if you like, the values and the skills have blended perfectly into what you're doing today to make you the right person for the right time to be one of the major faces fronting this movement right now. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind pulling some of those pieces together and giving our listeners a little bit of background. Sure. Well, first of all, you're too kind. I don't know if I'm 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 worthy of all of that praise, but uh I I've always been someone who believes that luck is when preparation meets opportunity and that is certainly uh defining uh, my current situation right now with my career and and this work in Bitcoin. I do come from a media background. I was always really passionate about the idea of working in the storytelling business. Uh, and I think part of that comes from the fact that when I was very little, um, some people might know I immigrated to the United States from Poland when I was five. My mom dreamt of coming here for for the American dream and for economic opportunity because my parents grew up under communism. And when we came here in order to learn English, we watched a lot of news uh, and movies and television. So I always envisioned myself working in media. I thought journalism especially was just this very noble profession where not only did you get to hold powerful people accountable, but you also got to learn. Uh, I just I love that stories allow you to learn about all different kinds of backgrounds and walks of life and and history and all of that. So uh, I I pursued, I mean, I basically am still doing a lot of what I learned in college. Not many people can say that exactly what they studied and got their, you know, bachelor's degree they're actually doing day to day. But I went to college set on journalism and I learned how to write, how to edit video. And I saw the industry kind of transforming even, even then. I mean, I've been out of college for a while, but it was starting to shift into that digital landscape and compete for, for, uh, for advertising money with the online views. Um, so it was really interesting to see that transformation happen. Um, but I was really, really passionate about being a journalist. Um, when my parents experienced the great financial crisis in 08, 09, 
they lost the home that they had worked so hard to um, to acquire here when they came to the U.S. And I I think a seed was planted for me. Uh, so I went into my journalism career thinking there's something wrong. There's something broken in this system. You know, Wall Street and all these big banks are getting bailed out. But the average American family um, is left holding the bag. And and I just didn't understand why all of that happened. And And it wouldn't I wouldn't understand it until I took the time to learn about Bitcoin. So I'm very grateful that I get to be focusing on this tool that I think is so powerful, but also positive. Um, for about 10 years, you know, I can speak for an hour just about how media has changed. But, you know, I covered a lot of tragedy and negative headlines and a lot of the pain that people were starting to feel, um, you know, the feeling that they were left behind and, and couldn't make ends meet and the cost of living kept rising around them. And Bitcoin is this is this tool that I think can fix a lot of these problems. And it won't be an easy fix or overnight. There are certainly going to be challenges. We don't know the future, but it is so overwhelmingly positive and empowering and allows us to maybe recreate our, our economic base layer on something that is really based on value and and merit. And, and it doesn't offer an advantage to a small group of people over everybody else. So uh, I kind of went all over the place with my answer there, but I'm just really, really excited to be working in this space and sharing Bitcoin and financial education. It, it is exciting and it's really hopeful. And I understand from listening to you speak a little bit over, you know, the last year and a half, two years that I've been in this space, that your mother was a gold bug and my mum was mm -hmm. too. And the reason I bring that up is because I grew up with a real understanding, and I think gold buds inherently get this, even if they're not necessarily overtly aware of the issues. I mean, my mother was, but but not all are, uh, of the of the systemic issues we face. So I grew up with a real sense of the problems that we faced, and but there wasn't a lot of hope. Gold was like um. It was like a potential escape or a hedge, but it wasn't hopeful the way Bitcoin is hopeful. Was that ex your experience too of gold? Did you understand the value of gold as you grew up? Did you understand why your mother was interested in gold as a hedge or as an asset to hold on to? When I was young, no. I mean, I... I saw it as really, you know, old fashioned and and everything was going digital by the time I was kind of coming of age. And so uh, I I really only interacted with money in a very digital way. I don't, I don't even remember a time where I used a lot of cash in the way that my my parents did throughout their lives. Um, but when I learned about Bitcoin, I really did appreciate uh, the value of of gold as a store of value and as something that can't be controlled or easily manipulated um, as as the physical gold, but it has a lot of a lot of issues because it takes a long time to transport. It's not very portable. It's not very fungible, and it's not easy to verify. And so there there is a reason why technology had to be built around um, creating some solutions for these problems because ultimately the the setbacks, the challenges with gold led to this fiat system with fractional reserve banking and paper notes that eventually turned digital. And then we took away the gold standard and now we're just printing as many units as as, as heavenly possible. And so we need to return to a system of of hard money. And I think Bitcoin does that and in, in, in it, it's digital gold, but better. <laughs> And uh, I, I never understood the power of hard money until until Bitcoin. Well and truly, and I think that's new to all of us. I think because it simply never existed before, not in this form, not with this level of hardness. Even gold hasn't had this level of hardness. And as you say, it also has some real limitations working against it, doesn't it? So I was interested to hear you call journalism a noble profession is how you perceived it when you went into it. And indeed, it always was. And there's elements of it that still are. You said you've seen a lot of changes in that over the years. I'm curious about two things there. It seemed to us or it came to light for a lot of people the same way that the need for hard money came to light for a lot of people during that period. A lot of people came awake to Bitcoin, were orange pills into Bitcoin during COVID and through the money printing era. So 
we also became awake to what appeared to be going on in journalism. And instead of journalists pushing back and questioning, what we seemed to see was enormous collaboration between governments and mainstream media. And of course, a lot of people moved over to independent and decentralized media during that time. So what was your experience? You would have perceived that very differently, I would imagine, to most of us. Uh, you might have seen a more gradual change over the years. You might have been already aware of those changes. What's been your sense of that change over the years? Yeah, you know, at first I didn't really perceive it. And I think when I was first entering into the profession, I, I definitely knew that something was wrong in the system when it when it comes to the economy and the financial situation because of the great financial crisis. But it, it didn't really impact my politics at the time. I, I mean, when I was in in college or high school, I didn't really pay attention to, you know, whether someone vote, voted right or left. It certainly didn't characterize them and 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 define their entire identity like it does today it seems uh it wasn't you know breaking up friendships the way that you voted so i think the shift started to happen right around 2016 when everything became sort of politicized and i saw that the industry overall um seemed to to be going for one candidate over another you know whether whether you agreed with that or not um and so for me i just i didn't realize until Bitcoin that the incentives had been breaking down because television used to be the gold standard and everyone used to sit down and watch appointment news, right? And that was one of the reasons why I was excited about going into the profession because really, I mean, if you were even a local anchor person, um, you had a lot of, um, you know, you you had the ability to call into question the laws that were happening around you. You could sit down with prominent names in your community and people knew who you were because they sat down and watched. I mean, you were one of the main sources of information in, in addition to the newspaper. And I feel like it lost a lot of that because eyeballs went to, you know, these online sources and suddenly fewer and fewer people were watching the news and fewer uh, advertising dollars were going to the television networks. They had to figure out ways to compete and create online websites and social media. And so all of a sudden, the role of, let's say, a, a local reporter or anchor person, now they were doing the job of five people. They had to learn how to edit and uh, go live and shoot the video and edit the video. And and yet they were being paid less than what, what someone was being paid in, say, the 70s or 80s in the same profession. I mean, you saw real wage deflation in the industry as as television networks were competing for for advertising dollars with the online world. And so I think the incentives turned because, A, you had to, these television networks, they have to get companies that will advertise, right? Um, and and so if they're speaking out against some of these powerful monopolies that are rising, whether they're phar pharmaceutical companies or, or, or other um, companies that have, have gained power in our current system, then they might not get them as, as advertisers. And then when it came to the politicians, all of a sudden it was about access, you know, being able to sell the idea of that exclusive interview with the mayor or the governor or whoever it might be. So they're, they're, they were hungry for access as opposed to, you know, I always saw journalism as that fourth branch of government. You're supposed to hold them accountable um, and and make sure that corruption is not happening around you. And you're supposed to stand as that that neutral voice for the public. And uh, and I saw less and less of that. It was more about gaining access to the political voices or to the to the big company voices. Um, and so that starts to cross over into PR, you know, no longer journalism, which is one of the reasons I think I focus so much on investigative because, you know, I think you're doing a good job as a journalist if the people at City Hall are kind of worried when you're coming around or calling. You know, they're they're a little bit nervous and they, they're they not exactly super happy to see you. If you have a really tight relationship between the journalists and, and the politicians and then the politicians and, say, the bankers or the, the CEOs of these companies, then something is wrong in that system. And so, yeah, you know, I definitely saw this um, almost like a disillusion of of journalism as the watchdog and, and that was really sad to see and i think it happens less at local news networks because i think local reporters and producers 
are still really connected to the community and they report more on the issues on the ground. Whereas the really big television networks, it's a little bit harder because they are so connected to that apparatus that is the big corporation that owns you or, you know, the political offices that that you're covering. And uh, and then it starts to get into a world where it's not surprising to me that you see a lot of bias in increasing a lot of, you know, politicization of of the news. And uh, I felt definitely a little bit disillusioned by the end of my career um, because I really I just really wanted to cover the issues that mattered. And what I really wanted to cover was Bitcoin and the global financial system and what, why it's so inaccessible for so many people and why so many people have been left behind and shut out and and impoverished by it. But uh, I wasn't able to as much as I I wanted to. So I, I went off on my own and did it. Which was a tremendously brave move to go from that level of security. One of the things that always interests me, and in fact, one of the reasons I started this podcast was to get an understanding of the community and if we had values in common. And one of the values I found out very early was there was a lot of people who love traveling, and I believe you love traveling and continue to travel, perhaps maybe more for work these days, uh, as well as kind of personally. But this sense of adventure and entrepreneurship and risk-taking, measured risk-taking, risk management seems to be common in this community at this stage. Uh, is that something you've perceived in all the interviews you've done, all the people you mix with? Is that a fair assessment? I'm, I'm on the fringes over here in Melbourne. Uh, and why do you think that is? Absolutely. And I think it's because Bitcoiners are long term thinkers and they want to grow and shape the world around them and build the world that they want to see, which has been so exciting because I, I do think that it's a really powerful, positive mission that we're all on. Whereas fiat and and the current system, it, it causes all of us to be short term thinkers because at the end of the day, all of a sudden it becomes about survival, right? The next paycheck, making sure you can afford um, the college education and then the, you know, the, the family and the house and the retirement and everything that the pressure keeps pushing down on you because all of those things are just getting more and more expensive and we sort of accept it, right? We just sort of accept that inflation is a part of the system and we don't question it and we don't take that extra step. Whereas Bitcoiners have done that and they've put in the work and they've gone as deep as, um, you know, many of us have gone very, very deep to see what could possibly punch a hole in this in this beautiful network and and the potential that it provides. Um, and and when you do that, all of a sudden you start looking at the future as one of hope and abundance and how can you contribute to that and and what kind of opportunities it will present everyone if it's a system based on value as opposed to manipulation and theft. And so that's what gets me excited because you go around the world and, and you see everything from much, a much more positive point of view um, and 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 perspective. And I I love traveling now more than ever because, again, there was a point, I think, uh, in my 20s as I was reporting and I, you know, saw what my parents went through. And I just thought, wow, the, everything is getting harder. I mean, I don't look at the future with as much hope as I did when I was little. I look at it as kind of scary. How am I going to afford a life? You know, will I afford a family? Um, there's more and more crime and corruption. It seems like, why is this all happening? It feels very negative. And now after Bitcoin, I look at the world and I think, there is so much hope and potential, and we're going to be able to right some of these wrongs. We're going to be able to make it a more accessible world where more people have opportunity and they will be able to work hard because, you know, a lot of people, if if you just, if you feel like no matter how hard you work, you will never get ahead, what's the incentive to work hard, right? And I think a lot of people are getting there and they're venting their frustrations and they're turning to things like politics. Um, but if actually your work did pay off and you were able to afford the things you want and take care of your family and plan for a future, think of the things that we could create and think of how collaborative and more peaceful we could be as a society. And I really do think that way. I mean, Bitcoin really causes me to be a lot more positive about the future. Um, and I, I love to travel and, and meet people and help them understand too. And so many of the Bitcoiners are also very much in, in that in that worldview of positivity as well. And I love that about it. It really is infectious. You're so passionate about Bitcoin and it's so delightfully contagious. How do you maintain journalistic integrity 
when there's when there's such love and passion for the <laughs> for the thing like how do you maintain any neutrality or objectivity within that yeah you know um i i definitely think that i have crossed over to advocacy when it comes to bitcoin but i also see the world more objectively because of my passion and education within bitcoin if that makes sense i mean there are so many things that um we have come to accept or understand in our current financial education or around the world that is that's just completely wrong and backwards and benefits um a, a monopoly on money and and benefits central bankers and total top-down control and we really need to question that i mean if we are believers in in freedom of thought and expression and speech and and the freedom to acquire knowledge then we have to question some of these things that that people have just decided as a part of our a part of our life uh, and we have 160 currencies around the world, many of which exist in authoritarian governments. Billions of people still live in authoritarian regimes, and they need tools for freedom and human rights. And Bitcoin provides that. And so I get excited because... This is a this is a technology that is not political. Um, it's code, you know, it's a form of speech. And and we can really realign ourselves the way that we exchange value, the way we communicate and engage in commerce and business with one another in a way that is more fair. Our current system is not fair. Um, so it's it's e easy to, I guess, remain objective in that sense, because I think that through Bitcoin, we can create a system that everyone has the potential to succeed in if they want to. And right now, um, we have a system where the closer you are to the money printer, the more likely it is that you will succeed. And the further away you are, you're almost destined not to succeed. And and so the forces of freedom are really um, coming against the forces of control. And I think that this is a battle that some might see as negative or scary, I actually see it as very exciting and empowering because I believe that the forces of freedom will win um, and, and that will create a more abundant world of prosperity for future generations that we might not even see all the, the fruits of. I think that this is a situation where we're going to plant a tree and we not, might not be able to enjoy the shade of it, but our children or our children's children will. And that's very that's that makes it worth fighting for as well. Yeah, it really does. And I've had to extend my time horizon on that and lower my time preference, as it were. You're masterful at storytelling. You teach story uh, storytelling, visual communication and visual storytelling. Uh, what do we do well as a community and where do we need to improve our orange pilling uh, mm -hmm. as Bitcoiners? Yeah, I mean, everyone, one of the reasons why I wanted to start my my show or coin stories is because everyone has a story. Uh, everyone has a fascinating reason why they got into Bitcoin and why they believe in it, especially the folks in this space who come from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all nationalities, all ages. And so I love learning about people's stories um, because among the the things that make us different, you see universal themes always pop up. And it's this, you know, this this um, passion for for freedom and agency and self-determination and and wanting to see a future that is better than the the present or the the past that we came from. And so I just um I love hearing people's stories and I think we do that well. I think we tell our our stories well. But um, this space, I think, from the outside, at least I'm thinking about the the early the early days when I was learning about Bitcoin, it can feel a little bit in intimidating because it is very technical. A lot of the folks in it have a deep background in computer science and engineering uh, or finance. And so I think that, you know, for someone who maybe doesn't have that background, it can feel like uh, like there are a lot of hurdles and there are a lot of walls up. But I want to encourage people that it's a lot easier to understand than than it may look. The space is very, very welcoming. And I think we need to be better about just speaking to the average person without this technical you know, background. We need to be non-political nonpartisan, not controversial. We need to just talk about the things that really matter um, to the everyday person, which is 
what is happening in the economy, what's really happening with banking and and our money and the history and and how it has evolved and technology. You know, I think through Bitcoin, I actually appreciated the internet a lot more because I didn't really, I grew up sort of getting the internet at a, at a young age and I was playing around with AOL and, um, you know, early computers when I was in my, probably uh, right around the age of like 10 to 12. And I didn't appreciate how it all worked. I didn't know how the commu- the computers were communicating with one another. And then and then what happened as applications were built on top of that, like even our iPhones, you know, all of that kind of feels like magic if you don't take the time to sort of learn about it. And Bitcoin really forces you to to do that so that you really appreciate the technology behind Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and why it's so powerful and secure. So I think we just need to simplify the message as, as much as possible, because if you're in the space, you're in that echo chamber, right? And we're all talking to each other with these uh, the, the vocabulary that we're very comfortable and familiar with. But for a person looking in, um, we need to remember what it was like when we all started and just really simplify, simplify the message um, and help people get on board and, and help people realize how early they are even today. Because a lot of people think that they're late to Bitcoin and, and they're not. We're still very, very early. This episode of Bitcoin People proudly brought to you by BitRefill, your one-stop shop for living on Bitcoin and Lightning and building out the Bitcoin economy and the Bitcoin standard world we would all love to see come to fruition. They've got all the best gift cards like Amazon, Apple, Bunnings, Airbnb, Uber and much more. Coles and Woolies for your groceries, Bill Ferries to pay your bills, BP and Ampol for your petrol. You can do your hotel bookings or top up your phone credit or buy a gift or phone credit for a friend or loved one overseas. So check them out today, bitrefill.com. And remember to include Bitcoin people in the referral code for 10% Bitcoin back on your first purchase. Uh, Yeah, and that's always worth, uh, it's something that I bring up and, and had to bring up recently. I've been doing a series of educations to the Libertarian party here in Melbourne, Australia, just to local branches, and really finding that line between when you've got some people in the room who know a fair bit about it and other people in the room who are brand new to it and trying to find that line of covering off enough detail. And also when I've been a guest on a on a podcast, trying to find where's the line of giving enough detail that people feel secure about the cryptography and the security of it and the hard cap of 21 million, I found myself kind of going right down into hard forks and soft forks recently to explain <laughs> yeah. why the 21 million can't be changed. And it gobbled up, you know, five minutes of time that I didn't really have and I'm sure didn't add value. But I thought, but that's got to be a question in people's mind is how can you be sure? How can you be sure? And so I think perhaps I need to take a more gradual approach in going, okay, well, you just can't fit it all into one interview right. or one education session. And no. you need to keep it at that higher level. Is that something you've kind of developed and evolved for yourself over time? Yeah, for me right now, my biggest goal with education is at least sparking that initial curiosity for people to start to do the work because it does. It takes a while. I mean, I remember there was a there was a total um, different mindset I had when I was just buying a little bit of Bitcoin versus now where literally the majority of my net worth is in Bitcoin and I've gone as deep as I possibly can and I've I've tried to steal in every argument, you know, and I I still I I look for as many possible answers to the question of what am I missing and how, how could I be wrong about this and what would that look like? And I haven't I haven't been able to find anything that I trust actually more than Bitcoin. Um, but it, it takes people a while to get there. And and I can totally appreciate that, especially because, you know, with the Internet, there was no risk of losing your life savings by sending an email, right? So it was easy to experiment and onboard because it was just communication. But when you're transitioning to actually sending value, I mean, this is what you've worked so hard for and you want to store it into the future and it's harder and harder to make sure that you like maintain the value of your money. Um, that's where it starts to get, you know, people get scared and I completely understand it. So I think that Taking baby steps is always really important. Starting off with a smaller position, downloading a wallet, sending someone Satoshi's, you know, interacting with it first and seeing how easy it is to use. 
and then starting to take those next steps of understanding Bitcoin mining and the energy component, how important that is, um, and also self-custody, you know, because before I got to self-custody, there were so many steps before that where I just wasn't comfortable becoming my own bank. And so really, um, I think it just takes time for people to get there and you have to start everyone slow. And some people are going to be attracted to Bitcoin for for one one reason or one aspect. Others, it's going to be from a different pain point. And, uh, and you just have to meet the audience where they're at, I think. Yeah, that's right. And and knowing how to do that is an art in its own right. Curiosity, as a podcaster, as a fellow podcaster, when you're interviewing people who have got a very tech background, so, uh, you know, as you, you've just talked about, it's full of computer scientists in this space, necessarily, how do you go about how do you go about that research process and putting together the questions given that's not your background and it's very difficult to ask smart questions or original questions or interesting questions of people who have such a vastly different specialization yeah sometimes it's it's the hardest to interview the smartest people and i found that in my in my old career for sure uh you know when i was getting my master's degree i focused it on health and science reporting because i was i was just always really interested in health topics uh, but but, you know, picking up a science journal can be quite hard and you'll meet these folks that are absolutely brilliant, but they have trouble articulating things in a simple way that the average person understands. And so when you don't come from that background uh, and you don't have the expertise and knowledge that they do, I would just drill it down to the simple question of explain this to me like I'm. 15 years old, like I'm a teenager and I don't have a science background. And uh, and you kind of whittle away. I mean, there were times where I, I've interviewed people throughout my career who, again, are just they're just so smart. So their mind operates in a different world with a different vocabulary and a different audience that they surround themselves with. Typically, um, you just have to get them to repeat, repeat, and dumb it down and dumb it down more and more. Um, and then you get to a bit of a, an understanding where you kind of meet meet they meet you where you're at and and I love that process because it is really learning and it challenges them you know I think it causes when you have to explain something simply that is one of the most powerful challenges and exercises in the world because it it really causes you to under you have to understand something so well to be able to explain it very simply if you can't explain it concisely and simply you might not know it as well as you probably should or you think you do. And I've found that as well. Uh, the people that are the best at, at articulating are the ones that truly, truly understand something. So uh, I just try to go at, you know, explain this to me like I'm five, like I'm 10, like I'm the like I'm your grandma, like whatever, you know, might help. But uh, but I think that, that helps when you're talking to people that have such a technical, scientific computer science background. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I'd love to just switch over a little bit to your life as as Nat Brunel. Uh, what what's a day in the life of a month in the life of Natalie Brunel look like? What does <laughs> what's you know how much time is researching? How much time is traveling? How much time is interviewing? What what does your day look like? What does a month look like? Oh, sure. Well, you know, there's definitely uh, no day is the same, uh, which is very similar to my former career in ma mainstream news, because there were a lot of a lot of days where I started out doing one story and something crazy happened and I had to pivot. And then you never know how long a, a breaking story is going to last. So it was very unstable in that way. And it's funny because I picked another industry that is 24 seven, right? Bitcoin doesn't sleep, news doesn't sleep. Um, and so you just, you kind of have to be on it uh, all the time. And I'm certainly scrolling through Twitter and looking at the latest headlines because something again can drop at any at any point that affects our, our space. So every day is very different. Um, for me, I focus a lot of attention on trying to find, um, you know, new guests, new topics to discuss, and preparing for those. Doing my research, so I'm a I'm a fervent, you know, observer. I watch all the the new interviews that are coming out. I listen to the shows. I watch for all the headlines and what people are doing in the space, so that I can cover it in a way that's um, you know, as intelligent as I possibly can. 
And uh, and then I travel a lot. You know, there even though it's a bear market and this is the time where things slow down a little bit, there are tons of events happening where Bitcoin is being discussed, whether it's within the Bitcoin or crypto ecosystem, but also in other industries. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at an insurance conference. It was insurance executives and senior professionals for professionals in uh, all aspects of the insurance industry. And they wanted a Bitcoin speaker. They wanted to really learn about the impact that Bitcoin might have on their industry. So a lot of events and educational uh, seminars. Uh, right now, I, I think I'm more busy than average because I'm planning. I've, I've launched some new segments to my show, including a news segment. So it's a 10 minute news update every week so that you can feel like you're out the door and in 10 minutes, like a short drive, you have all the updates you need to have when it comes to Bitcoin and economic news headlines. Um, and I'm working on a educational video series because again, I think it's really important to reach the general audience with these 101 fundamentals. And uh, I just really wanna provide that information in an approachable way that is not for the super techie to technical folks out there. So um, be on the lookout for that in the next couple of months as well. So I'm putting a lot of extra time in just to, to produce that right now. Good for you, fabulous, fabulous stuff. Did I see you were working on a book as well? Uh, you know, it's it's something that I'm I'm in the I'm trying to figure out what that book would be. You know, because there are a lot of amazing books in the space. Um, mm. So what what stories aren't told or what angle hasn't hasn't been told? Uh, that's that's the challenge. So maybe that educational video series will will help contribute to that. But it's certainly on my mind. I mean, I think that everyone should get their voice out there because different people resonate with different voices and audiences. You know, for me, I, I wanted to see more women in the space. And and when I see a woman, I want to listen to her and 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 what she feels about something. And, and that is something that I think attracts me. And so um, to, if I could be a voice that helps invite other women to see this as an approachable space that they want to learn more about, I, that would be really rewarding. Uh, I just want to help, you know, expand this community and make sure that the message is out there that Bitcoin is for everyone. How do we, uh, you must have been asked this a million times, but how do we bring more women into this space? What's been your personal experience of what works in getting women over the line? Is it any different to the conversation you have with men? You know, I, I don't think the conversation's different. I think that just women, community is really important for women. So I think women want to see other women represented and then they'll feel comfortable when you see a space that looks from the outside, sometimes like this crypto bro sphere, you know, and it's it's a lot of a lot of guys who are very in into the space of technology or computer science or engineering, you know, for some of my peers, my my girlfriends, that that isn't the most welcoming community. Um, and so I think if they saw more women engaged and sharing it in a way that is digestible and approachable, um, I think that they would be more, they would feel more invited or more interested and curious to learn about it. So I hope to be that, you know, I think that people learn from, from different voices that they relate to. And, and like I said, Bitcoin is for everyone. So I think we need all ages, all backgrounds all nationalities um i think we need everybody's voice in there the the polit the you know people that see it as more progressive the people that see it more conservative cuz someone is going to be out there that resonates with that particular message and i just think everyone needs to take the time to actually learn about it so um but we're going to get more women uh we've got i've got some women's events coming up at the at the the next conference that i'm going to so i'm really excited to connect with more women there as well that's great. And I do love the diversity of stuff. I know that Jason Meyer has got the book about the progressive case for Bitcoin, and I've just mm -hmm. recently had Alex Gladstone on the show. And, you know, if there was ever a progressive case for Bitcoin, what he's doing with the Human Rights Foundation is certainly it. Um, so it would be lovely to get that cohort to really see the difference it's going to make for humanity and creating a level play playing field, because that's really... I think that's something left or right we would all like to see. I think that idea of justice and fairness is a universal yeah. appeal, isn't it? Do you think of that as universal? 
Oh, absolutely. And and I would say that in my in the uh, audience that I have who are women, they're really interested in Bitcoin's human rights component and and implications. Um, and one thing that's interesting that I found is I, I think the women in my life are more, more risk averse. Um, they are, you know, they're making the financial decisions for their families. They're thinking about the next generation and how they're going to afford, you know, their kids' education and all that. And like really those 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 very important fundamental, how am I going to stabilize my family for many decades into the future? And what they don't understand is Bitcoin is actually the least risky thing if you really study it. I mean, it's the one thing that actually is predictable over the next hundred years, you know exactly what the supply is going to be in the monetary policy, and you know that it's decentralized. But most of my female audience sees it as super risky. They see it as, you know, the guys that are trading back and forth and into the stocks. And so they they, they see it as, as the risk asset, whereas they're focused on trying to find something less risky, more stable, thinking about saving. And they don't realize that Bitcoin is exactly that. That's really insightful. I really like that. Uh, so here I am, a podcaster. Most of us podcasters are here because we want to orange pill our friends and family is often why we start this thing. <laughs> in my case, I also simply wanted to meet some other Bitcoiners because I felt very alone down here in Melbourne before I found the, the Bitcoin community down here. Your top tip or the biggest mistake you see podcasters making in this space that we could do better in order to improve the way we educate? That's an interesting question. Uh, I would just say authenticity um, really shines through. And so just I think people just need to be themselves and not copy what else is already out there. Because if it's already out there, then, you know, why why just duplicate it? And I think everyone has something really unique to offer. No one's background is the same. No one's skill set is the same. No one's experience is the same. And so I think people really need to lean into their, their individualism and what they can contribute that is really new and unique and can resonate with, um, with a new audience. So I think that we just need more people being themselves and experimenting and putting their thoughts out there. Because I think in general, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly guilty guilty of this. A lot of people live with imposter syndrome, right? And they 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 don't take the risks. They look back at their lives. They, they I mean I I I constantly when I, whenever I've met um older folks that are, you know, in their twilight years, the one thing that they wish they could do is go back and tell themselves not to be so afraid or insecure and actually just get out there and try more and just be be happy and do the things that you want to do. Stop worrying that what everyone else is thinking about you because they're probably not. They're thinking about themselves, right? Stop worrying about the judgment. And I think we really, I think that's a really powerful, profound lesson that we all need because I think we can get in our in our heads. You know, we all live with these devices in our hands. Um, we're we're all on camera really now, right? And and people are judging us and we're all looking into each other's lives and making assumptions that may or may not be true. And I think you just have to be true to yourself. And if if there is value that you're providing, the market will see it and recognize it and reward you. And if there and if if you're not hitting a stride, try something different. You know, don't don't um, get too stuck. I think people need to be adaptable. And this is the time to really experiment because not, not only are we going to have a decentralized form of money, but we have this decentralized opportunity to share information and and create these you know, media platforms where we can share different voices and learn about people from all over the world. Great, indeed. Okay. Conscious of your time, you watched a lot of movies when you were young, as you've already talked about, and it was part of your family's way of learning English. And so movies and stories have become and, and have been a big part of your life. If you could identify with a major character or storyline or movie or combination thereof that represents your life and who you are, who would it be or what movie would it be? Oh gosh, that's <laughs> that's that's really tough. Um I I don't know if it's I don't know if my my life 
embodies it. At, it well, it doesn't really at all. But um, but the person that I just I I loved up until a certain point toward the end of the series was um Daenerys Targaryen in Game of Thrones. I I love Game of Thrones so much. I've watched the series multiple times, and I think there are a lot of um takeaways and similarities to our current world. And I thought that her transformation was really was really amazing to watch as a character who was kind of like shy toward the beginning and uncertain of herself and very naive. And then she grew to be so strong. And um, and until the end, again, because I think the writers of the TV show kind of butchered her at the end for me. But but she was going to be this truly benevolent ruler who saw the rule of law as very, very important. And she she was um, she was not going to compromise this idea that you had to you had to be a good moral person. But she was also just kind and and giving. And I think she would have been a great leader. Um, and I don't I don't think that the author intended for her to 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 do what she did at the end and also it helped that she had three dragons but i just always loved her character so it's it's i'm certainly not a um a a, a dragon queen but uh, i would like to be if i could <laughs> <laughs> moral to the story we all need more dragons on our side <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could take care of fiat very quickly if we had three dragons <laughs> just burn down all the money printers i like it exactly <laughs> If you had any final words for our listeners, if there was someone listening for the first time here, if this was their very first introduction to Bitcoin, if they'd never heard another podcast in their whole lives and this was it, what would you be saying to them? I would say that think about your life and whether the amount of hope that you have for the future has changed. Has it decreased? And if it has, ask yourself why? What are the things that are making you worried about the future? And know that there is this powerful technology that so many people from all different backgrounds and all different levels of expertise and careers have found that it will provide hope, that it is the solution to some of our biggest problems. And they are willing to put their money where their mouth is. And they're dedicating their lives to it in some cases, including me. And so it, it's really worth it to just take the time. If you want to look at the future as something that you look forward to and one that could be better than what we have right now and one that's more peaceful and more abundant and um, and is just and is better for everyone, uh, it's worth it to to take the time to study Bitcoin. What a beautiful note to finish on. Natalie Brunel, thank you so much for taking the time, for your generosity of time and spirit and for everything you're doing in this space. Really an honor to meet you. All the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. 99.9% .9 of people store most of their value in, in our currency and they have no idea how our current monetary system works. And so when we talk about, do you need to understand something to store your purchasing power in it? I would say no because most people do it already. And so I think when we look at Bitcoin through that same lens, I think having a shard of an understanding of our current monetary system and, under, uh, and recognizing that our purchasing power can be devalued as the monetary supply is expanded, I think just recognizing that and realizing that Bitcoin has a supply cap of 21 million, you can already start to see how purchasing power can increase over time. And so I think having these basic fundamental understandings of Bitcoin's kind of key characteristics is important because that will give you longevity in being able to stay true during the price volatility. But outside of that, I don't believe that people need to understand the ins and outs of hashing and uh, mining and whatnot to be able to really invest their purchasing power in Bitcoin.